DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware, makers of better things for better living through chemistry, presents the Cavalcade of America. Away, all boarding parties. An age-old naval battle cry was only heard once in the 20th century. It was during World War II. Tonight's cavalcade recreates the action in which that battle cry was heard. Our star, Wendell Corey. My name is Dan Gallery. In World War II, I was captain of a ship, a simple, frail, and homely little baby flat top. Her official name was Guadalcanal, but we called her Can Do. Among the battleships and cruisers and the great carriers of the Essex class, she seemed like a tiny Cinderella. But she was handy, happy-go-lucky, and didn't know the meaning of the word impossible. We were operating against enemy submarines in the North Atlantic. Our task group had just sunk one of Hitler's crack U-boats, and we were headed home with her captain and crew. After securing our prisoners below, my executive officer, Commander Johnson, reported to my sea cabin on the bridge. Prisoners secured and submitted to preliminary questioning, Captain. Getting the answers? No, just the usual. Name, rank, and ship. Refused to answer all other questions. Plant that mic in their quarters, as I suggested? Oh, yeah, yeah. All we got was some hot telephone numbers in Hamburg. Seems they like them blonde and plump. All right, Johnson. Now, uh, bring in there, Skipper. I'll have another go at him. Aye, aye, sir. In here, Captain. Thank you. Good afternoon, Captain. Captain Dane. Good morning, Captain Hanky. Sit down, please. Thank you. Cigarette? Thank you. How are things going? Water's comfortable? Anything you need? We have no cause for complaints. Good. Now, there's just a few questions I'd like Captain to ask. Captain Gallery, I must remind you that under the laws of war... I'm glad you mentioned that, Captain Hanky. Because you and your crew have been accused of shooting survivors in violation of the laws of war. Those charges are false. Huh? Yes, I can prove it. Good. I hope you can. Then answer my questions and I'll do what I can for you. I uh, think I know what you want. The key to our codes and code changes. Correct? Well? I don't know it. I swear it on my honor as a German officer. Who does know it? No one. The code books went to the bottom with my submarine. I see. Do all your submarines operate on the same code system? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you, Captain Hanky. You've been very cooperative. Any more questions? Not at present. (laughs) I warn you. This information will do you no good. Why? Because you will never lay hands on one of those code books. Seem very sure of that. You think you sank my submarine, don't you? With all due respect, Captain, as long as she's sunk, I don't care who sunk her. With all due respect, that is why you are losing the Battle of the Atlantic. Oh, come now. I know you opened the sea valves before you abandoned ship. There's nothing unusual in that. But you do not know the extra precautions we take. Oh, something really ingenious out there, like a time bomb. Fourteen demolition bombs, set to go off automatically within minutes of abandoning ship. Why do you volunteer this information? Just in case, Captain. In case you're entertaining any rash ideas. My U-boat skipper made a couple of shrewd guesses. But he gave me more information than he realized. If only we could get our hands on the German code books, we'd know the movements of every Nazi U-boat. I turned Henke over to Naval Intelligence at Norfolk. And at the next departure conference of my task group, I outlined a plan for getting one of those code books. It was a hundred to one shot, but we decided to try it. On the way to the submarine hunting ground, we checked out the new air squadron off the flight deck of my carrier. Launch aircraft. Launch aircraft. (laughs) 
One by one, we got our planes in the air. Fighter directors got busy below the flight deck, charting radar scopes, broadcasting vectors of the pilots. All the brains of a modern fighting carrier went to work. Abaft the chart house on the bridge of our van destroyer Chatelaine, the men of the sonar watch were listening in on the underwater subdetecting equipment. Hey, listen, we got something? There's an echo. Oh, it's nothing. Probably just a whale. Man, I'm getting so I hear that noise in my sleep. Yeah, it's getting monotonous. When that thing stops being monotonous, you'll wish it stayed monotonous. Oh, get a load of him. And uh, how many wolf packs have you sunk, Admiral? Plenty. But we won't run into any wolf packs in these waters. Well, that's something to be grateful for, eh, Marty? Yeah, the only thing I'll be grateful for is Casablanca. Gee, I wonder if we'll get ashore and get a chance to see it. Yeah, how about that? Casablanca. Man, I always want to see that place. What's so special about Casablanca? You have been there, Chief? I've been in this man's Navy 15 years. If it's a seaport, I've been there. Hey, I'd like to see that joint. You know, from the movie of the same name. What joint? In Casablanca. Remember? This dame shows up. She's escaped from the Nazis. Yeah, you remember the song. You must remember this. A kiss is still a kiss. A sigh is just a sigh. The fundamental things hey, are like... Hey, look, the only fundamental things in your life right now is them sonar sounds. <laughs> what gets me is, is how a tone-deaf guy like him ever got on the sonar watch. Who's tone-deaf? <laughs> you are, Junior. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Knock it off, you guys. We're hunting submarines, and that's big game hunting. And don't forget it. We ain't making moving pictures, you know. Uh, a whole month and nothing. Why, if this was the movies, we'd have seen a dozen sub-wolf packs by now. And don't worry about wolf packs. It's the subs that run alone. A sub alone can be more dangerous than the ones that hunt in packs. Yeah? How you figure that? You ever see a cornered rat? It's the same with a sub. I seen one let loose with six fish right while she was sinking. And those torpedoes were running wild. Contact! Bridge. Check bearing. Zero, four, three. Hey, this sounds good. It's good, all right. Doppler is up. It's coming toward us. Where is it? Zero, four, five, two thousand yards. Sonar to bridge. We have a possible contact. Bearing zero, four, five, two thousand yards. Bridge to sonar. Classify contact. Sonar to bridge. Contact solid metallic. Classified submarine. Bridge to sonar. Very well. Reporting contact to task. In a matter of seconds, I received by the TBS the Chatelaine's contact report. I picked up the bridge mic. Task group commander to Chatelaine. Proceed on firing run. Acknowledge. Over. Chatelaine to task group commander. Will call. Out. Commander Johnson. Aye, aye, sir. Sound general quarters. All hands to general quarters. Man your battle stations. All hands to general quarters. Man your battle stations. The ship became alive as men hurried to their stations. On the bridge above the flight deck, Johnson and I watched the planes. Our combat air patrol circled, trying to sight the sub. I listened to the bridge monitor, the VHF, directing their movements in their own peculiar lingo. Orbit Tomcat under mattress, Angel 6. Come on a Wildcat, bandit closing vector 090 buster. Roger out. Reduce speed, Johnson. Come around to port. Aye, aye, sir. Task group commander to all ships. Stand by to move in on target according to plan. Casino. Aye, aye, sir. Standing by. Get down on deck and take over your boarding party. Aye, aye, sir. Boarding party, Captain. Yeah, that's what I said. Aye, aye, sir. Also, check those planes out there. See if they sighted that sub yet. Aye, aye, sir. Can do to Cadle. What see? There's a dark patch just ahead going for a look. There we go. <laughs> Charlie Ho, sighted sub, 12 o'clock. Check Roberts. Aye, aye, sir. Can do to Roberts. What see? It's a sub, all right, and it's a big one. Group commander to Chatelaine. Wildcats are over target. Commence and coordinate depth charge attack. Chatelaine to group commander. Commencing attack with depth charges. Head shallow. With 
With our plane still circling overhead, the Chatelaine tossed her first depth charge into the water. The other destroyers moved in to form a rough semicircle about the submerged target. They rode the swells as the first charges exploded. Great geysers of salt water shot into the air. Before they'd subsided, others rose a few yards away. On the bridge of the carrier, we waited. Listening on the VHF to the voices of our pilots as they watched the attack from the air. Cadle to Chatelaine, over wide, reverse course. Chatelaine to task group commander, reversing course. Task group commander to all ships, proceed as directed by plane. Well, Johnson, here we go. If we can scare that sub to the surface without damaging Roberts, it too much. Roberts, Chatelaine. That last one shook her. She's trying to dive deeper. If we've sunk her oh, out... She's straightening out again. She's just below the surface. And badly damaged. Hand me that mic. Task group commander to all ships. See if we can bring her to the surface without further damage. I want to capture this buzzard. <laughs> Our planes dived to indicate the new position of the submerged U-boat. The Chatelaine moved in closer with her sun. At that moment, in one of the planes, Cadle pushed down his transmitter button. His voice rang out on the VHF. You struck oil. Stop is surfacing. At 11.22 and a half, just 12 and a half minutes after the Chatelaine's original report, the black shape of the submarine conning tower hove itself up out of the water, less than 700 yards from our van destroyer. She's good and hit, all right. I don't think she'll do any fighting. I'm not taking any chances. Commence firing. Commence firing! swooped down. Fifty caliber machine guns blazing, sending torrents of steel ripping across the sub's deck. Destroyers just threw small stuff calculated to scare the crew into the ocean without actually inflicting a fatal wound on the sub itself. Commander Johnson kept his glasses focused on the conning tower hatch. At 11.25... The hatch is opening, Captain. Sub's crew is coming out. Look, they're going over the side. All ships and planes cease fire. Cease fire! All ships and planes, cease fire. Lower boats to pick up survivors. Lower boats to pick up survivors. Well, there's our prize, Johnson. I should look to you. The way she's riding, I'd say her after torpedo room is flooded. She's got four more torpedo tubes in her snout. And she's still moving. Think they left a suicide watch aboard her? I think he was right. They've left more than that aboard. Here, look, she's moving in circles. Rudder must be jammed. She's probably lost steerage way. A mixed blessing. She might just flounder around to where she could aim one of her fish at us. Which is about where we came in on Captain Henke's sub. Within minutes, he said. What's that, sir? Fourteen demolition charges. Pilots our lives against those code books. With them, we'll be able to save thousands. I guess it's worth the risk. Survivors are being picked up, Captain. Shall I secure them below? No, let them stay on deck. I'd like them to see this show. Right. I'll let your boarding party, Trasino. Ready to go. Aye, aye, sir. Oh, and Earl. Sir? Good luck. Thank you, sir. Johnson? Looks like we made it. Yes, sir. Well, here goes. Attention, all ships. Put this on all squawk boxes so all hands can hear it. How's our timetable running? Three seconds. Okay. Now. Away, all boarding parties! boarding parties. Away all boarding parties. A call that hadn't been heard in our Navy in over 130 years. Even over modern loudspeakers, it had a salty ring to it that recalled the days of piracy, of hand-to-hand fighting on the decks of sailing ships, and of enemy vessels claimed as prizes of war. Our enemy crew abandoned ship, 
and the U-505 was ours. Ours, that is, if she didn't sink or blow up. Listening to the DuPont Cavalcade of America, starring Wendell Corey. And now Bill Hamilton speaking for the DuPont Company. When you turn on the lights of your home with a flick of a switch, it's hard to believe that in this day and age, the lantern is still an important source of light. But when floods and other disasters cut power supplies, gasoline lamps come into their own. And campers, hunters, farmers, and people in isolated areas still use them. But one of the best-known lanterns burns with a brighter glow today because of a small rayon bag that is tied onto the burner. Treated with chemicals, the rayon leaves a glowing residue as it's burned. One reason rayon is used is because it is chemically pure and contains no impurities that might cut down the light. Thus, rayon, one of DuPont's five man-made fibers, demonstrates once again its versatility as one of DuPont's Better things for better living through chemistry. And now we return to our cavalcade play, Away All Boarding Parties, starring Wendell Corey as Captain Gallery. As skipper of the aircraft carrier Guadalcanal, leading a task group against Nazi submarines in the Atlantic, Captain Daniel Gallery has conceived a daring plan to gain possession of the code books by means of which the movements of all U-boats are controlled. As our story continues, he has forced the U-505 to surface, but instead of sinking her after she has been abandoned by her crew, he plans to board her and take her in tow as a prize of war. At the sound of that ancient battle cry of the sea, away all boarding parties, Half a dozen whaleboats from the ships of our task group streaked toward the abandoned Nazi sub. The boat from the Pillsbury with Lieutenant David and a party of eight men scraped the side of the dangerously pitching sub at approximately 11.55. Lieutenant David, torpedo man's mate Al Nispel, and radio man Sam Doyak managed to scramble aboard. Doyak, guard that hatch. Keep that Tommy gun ready. There may be more crowds below. Aye, aye, sir. Nispel? Take a look up forward. Aye, aye, sir. Nothing up here but one dead German, sir. Okay, let's have a look below. Nobody here, sir. Doyak, check the forward compartments down here. Aye, sir. Nispel, come with me. So far, so good. Eh, nobody in this compartment either. Well, at least we're lucky so far. You better... Hey, listen. There's water pouring in somewhere. I'll go check. It's up here, pouring. What is it? The whole compartment's flooded. More pouring in, and it's coming in fast. Can you stop it? I don't know. The Heine's yanked the lid off this sea valve just to make sure she'd sink. Water's pouring in so fast, I'm not sure we can get it back on. Come on, we've got to. Where's the lid? Probably right around here, somewhere under the water. Better feel around for it. You got something? That thing. Metal. Kind of heavy. You read German? Yeah. It's a can of beans. Hold on. I think this is it. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Now, if I can just fit it on here. I, I can't seem to get it all the way. There's too much pressure. Here, let me give you a hand. Yeah. All right. Take it easy. Yeah. Watch it. I'm trying to get the lock on. Now, hold it a second. Hurry up. I can't hold on much longer. Wait. Uh, Got it? Yeah. Yeah. Get the light gone out. I think... Hey! That humming noise, you hear it? Yeah, that sub's electric motor. We better stop it. Come on. I hope the remote circuits aren't piled up. There's the main control panel. There ought to be one of these master switches along here. Yeah. Yo, wait a minute. Don't touch it yet. Not so Doyak checks it for booby trap wires. The crowds have got this sub wired to explode after she's abandoned. Come on, let's see if he's found any. If he didn't meet any crowds up forward. I'll have that gun ready when I open this door. Oh, very pretty, Doyak. 
Now take off that trout hat and come in here. I want this control panel check for booby trap wires. Aye, aye, sir. I figured the first thing we'd do would be to stop the motor. Did you find anything? Well, these plates are welded on. There are no marks in the back. Looks clean to me, sir. Okay, Nistle. Stop the motors. Okay, sir. There goes nothing. What's going on? What happened? She's rocking like a steer. The forward momentum must have been keeping her up. Now that she's dead in the water, she's getting... She's settling there by the stern. All right, never mind it. Start yanking up those floor plates. There are demolition charges planted somewhere aboard and wired to a time detonator. Uh, Don't worry, sir. I'm an expert on clock-type detonators. Yeah, but we don't know what time it is by the German clock. Lieutenant David's men set to work fast and furiously, disconnecting electric leads from demolition charges, looking for other booby traps, and closing the sea valves. At 12.30, Commander Tresino went aboard with a party from the Guadalcanal. Good work, David. All you men did a good job. Thank you, sir. You taking over now? Yes. Pillsbury will take the sub and tow. In the meantime, we'll see if we can center that rudder with the hand-steering apparatus. Uh, the hand-steering outfit is in that compartment over there, sir. But, but the door's jammed, and we've got it tagged as a suspected booby trap. Have you tried to debug it? No, sir. Why not? Well, Captain Gallery's orders were not to monkey with booby traps. We've got to get that door open. If we don't get this sub under control fast, we're going to lose it. Aye, aye, sir. Doyak, signal the Guadalcanal. Say we want the skipper's permission to operate on a booby trap. <laughs> At 1312, we secured a tow line to the bow of the U-505. Two minutes later, Earl Tresino's message about the booby trap was delivered to me on the bridge. I've been itching for an excuse to get aboard that sub ever since we captured her. Now I had it. My executive, Commander Johnson, took over the bridge, and I took over the U-505. Oh, Captain, we've got to get that hand-steering outfit rigged. He just won't tow. Is that where your suspected booby trap is? Yes, the door's jammed. And, and Who spotted it? I did, sir. Doyak, radium in second. How do you figure it? Well, sir, the way the metal's jammed in there, it looks like the wire might be rigged from under the door handle. You see the marks on the screw there? Well, if they screwed the handle back on without setting off any explosion, it stands to reason we I could... I see what you mean. Let's have that screwdriver. Yes, sir. Here you are, sir. <laughs> battered hull of the pitching submarine was still leaking seawater in a dozen places. It was hard to keep steady and hard to keep a foothold standing in four inches of oily water. As I started work on the door handle, a wave of tension rose from the men grouped around me. I saw it in their figures shattered against the bulkhead by the flickering emergency light. The sea seemed to be pressing in against the weakened plates of the hull. I hesitated, wondering whether to clear the man out before going on with it. Then the sub gave a sickening lurch, and Lieutenant David yelled down the hatch. Captain! Captain! The sub is shearing to starboard. The line's pulled tight at the fiddle string. He's ready to snap. That settled it. With our stern already underwater, the pull of the tow line could roll us over. If the tow line snapped, it might slide backwards to the bottom. I lifted my foot at right angles to the door and kicked! All right. Get somebody on that rudder. Aye, aye, sir. Well, Doyang, how'd I do as a booby trap expert? You got plenty of nerves, sir, but I think you took a terrible chance. Yeah, I was pretty sure it wasn't the booby trap. I wasn't thinking of that, sir. The compartment might have had a big leak in it. We might have been flooded out. Yeah, that's what scared me. Earl, come with me. I want to have a look at that crowd skipper's personal correspondence. Uh, this will collect it. I'll give it here. Uh, yes, sir. Here it is. We dug it all out, Captain. Here's the ship's log, sailing orders, transcripts of radio messages. Code book, man. Where's the code book? Code book? I don't know, sir. I thought I got everything. You haven't got the code book? The very thing we're after? Come on, let's get back to the captain's cabin. Here's his desk. Oh, where could that thing be? Look in his locker. Now, here it is. Ah, secret compartment. Good. Good. No pages torn out. It's okay. Now, all we have to do is convince a few skeptics back in Washington. Skipper, if we get to Bermuda with a German sub in tow... They'll believe anything we tell them. When I climbed the sea ladder again on the Guadalcanal, we hoisted the traditional broom at our masthead and squared for Bermuda. We were proud to be the only American ship in modern times to have taken an enemy submarine at sea as a prize of war. We were proud, yes, but we couldn't even spin sailors' yarns about it. 
Because the whole operation was top secret and stayed that way. It had to. Now that it can be told, I'm proud to report that we all kept that secret. And that the code books from our captured sub became a major weapon in our final victory in the Battle of the Atlantic. Our thanks to Wendell Corey and the Cavalcade players for tonight's story, Away All Boarding Parties. And now Bill Hamilton speaking for the DuPont Company. Francis Bacon, the famous philosopher who lived more than three centuries ago, said that the alchemists of his time, who were always looking for ways to make gold, reminded him of a wise old farmer who told his sons that he had left them a treasure buried somewhere on his land. But he did not say where. After the farmer's death, the sons got busy and plowed the place up better than ever before. They did not find what they expected. But the intensive plowing produced a plentiful crop. And that was the treasure that their father really had in mind. In many DuPont research laboratories today, there are treasures similar to those that Bacon had in mind. Thousands of chemicals that have turned up in the course of research. What these chemicals are made of and how they were made are known. But their full value is not yet known. Much scientific plowing still needs to be done before they'll produce a plentiful crop of useful products. Maybe some of them never will. But here they are, constantly available for trial and study. And because they are readily available, they save scientists many hours of research time. During World War II, for example, when a search was being made for an anti-malarial drug, some 1,200 compounds were taken from the shelf and tested. Although none of them supplied the answer... They made it possible for research workers to eliminate unsuitable chemicals quickly and continue their search in other directions. A scientist cannot rise up in the morning and say, this is a fine day to make a valuable new product for mankind. But he can feel sure that from the continued efforts of a large and well-trained staff backed by extensive facilities will come important developments. This is the fate of DuPont scientists as they continue to search for better things for better living through chemistry. Tonight's DuPont Cavalcade was written by Robert Tallman and was based on an article from the book Clear the Decks by Rear Admiral Daniel V. Gallery, U.S. Navy, who was Captain Gallery at the time of the action dramatized on Cavalcade tonight. Our technical advisor for this broadcast was Lieutenant Commander Kane Lynn, United States Navy. Original music was composed by Arden Cornwell, conducted by Donald Voorhees. The program was directed by John Zoller. Mr. Corey may soon be seen starring in the Paramount picture, Jamaica. And this is Cy Harris reminding you to be with us next week when the DuPont Cavalcade will again present last Thanksgiving's award-winning broadcast, Path of Praise. The star of that broadcast will be with us again, the Dean of the American Theater, Walter Hampton. <laughs> The DuPont Cavalcade of America came to you tonight from the Velasco Theater in New York City and is sponsored by the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware, makers of better things for better living through chemistry. Tonight, just for laughs, listen to Red Skelton on NBC.